Great. Okay. So, um, well, so this this will be maybe a little different because I I um, basically will talk about um, how I've been using Jasmine in my own research. Um, I, I basically emailed Poppy to say thank you for giving me access to the notebook service a while ago, and uh, because it saved me an awful lot of work at the time actually being able to use Jasmine, and then you know, we, of course I, I was asked to sort of talk about it too. So. I, I'll primarily talk about my science. I hope you'll find that uh, interesting. And then towards the end, I will try and sort of draw out some, some uh, workflows that I've been using in Jasmine that hopefully you'll find useful too. So the, the um, research question I'm interested in particularly is, is how um, convective clouds in the, in the tropics, particularly the tropic Atlantic here, how they organize together. So this is actually a, a photograph I took out of a plane a year ago at a field campaign in Bar just off the coast of Barbados called Eureka. Um, and really we're, we're trying to understand what controls the formation of these clouds. So this is just a satellite image from, from MODIS just to give you an idea of what, what it looks like. And you've got Barbados down there for, for um, give you an idea of scale. And if you look at these clouds, you, you might think, feel like they sort of have a distinct pattern to them and actually uh, researchers have started giving these different patterns names. And so they're calling these, these flowers. And if you look um, at the same region during the same uh, winter period, you can find totally different cloud structures forming. Um, and these, these have been uh, called sugar. And actually by looking at satellite images like this, um, people come up with, with four classes like this. Um, here they call them gravel, where you have these arcs. They're sort of these words are meant to sort of describe what's going on, and and really it's it's sort of that level we are of sort of looking at them and trying to understand what kind of patterns form with these clouds. Here, there's a final one called fish, look a bit like a fish bone. Um, so the the reason for doing this is that it turns out the representation of these shallow clouds is really tricky for climate models, and actually uh, the majority of uncertainty. It, in climate um, sensitivity estimates is, is due to the representation of these clouds. And one part of that um, is, is how they organize together. So something is making these clouds lump together in different patterns, and we don't really know what controls that. So I got these images in my email inbox from, from uh, collaborators in, in Eureka, and I thought, oh, wow, presuming machine learning could do this, right? Why, why should we come up with these four classes ourselves? must be possible to build a machine learning algorithm that could sort of learn itself what kind of panic exists. So that's basically the task I set myself was to, to have that. So something that you could basically feed a, a load of images and it would work out itself what kind of patterns form in there. Um, so I spent a long time thinking about how one might do this. And I realized that when we look at patterns in data, and this would be anything, not just satellite images like this, what we're implicitly doing in our minds is that we're actually placing these um, images into a sort of coordinate system in our mind. You know, we're, we're thinking of ways that they're distinct. Um, and you might hear, you might say, you know, maybe feature silence and cloud fraction might be the you know, measures here. That's not saying that this is exactly what the you know, researchers have done coming up with these names, but it's just, that's what we're doing. And the process we're doing is basically coming up with some sort of mapping, some sort of coordinate system that we can place these images in, in our mind. And so I realized that's what I wanted my neural network to do. Um, and it turns out that this is a, is a sort of a, a whole area of machine learning that uh, is, is really common and actually very powerful. This process is called producing an embedding. So you take something that's very high dimensional, like an image in this case, and then you, you feed it through a neural network and you get a point, right? And, and this, this point it is in some, some high dimensional space. And the, the first example I, I came across like this was um, a really cool uh, technique called word to vec where they basically have to do the same, but for words, and the machine learning algorithm uh, learns to take individual words and map them into a high dimensional space. And just from how it's fed the words in pairs, you know, so in the uses in the English language, it actually ends up building up relationships between these words purely on its own account, right? And so, things that you might, it could, could learn is sort of what, what happens when you try and subtract Christmas out of Santa, for instance, or if you look at uh, the, 
the, the vectors sort of spanning from say London to England, they might be similar to the ones spanning from Copenhagen to Denmark. So the, the neural network has learned something about the relationship between a, a capital city and, and its country here. And I saw this and I thought, wow, this is just incredible. Like how can a neural network learn this just out of nothing? And so I went searching for something like this for, for satellite images or for images basically and came across this technique called tied to VEC. Um, I'm not gonna go into exactly how they train that here, but I can talk about that at the end if you want. But basically the, the key to point here, out here is that I, I use a very common architecture called a convolutional neural network, which basically can extract you know, um, through compositing convolution operations. So basically just matrix uh, calculations, uh, multiple, uh, multiple matrix calculations successively with their nonlinear transformations in the middle it basically takes any, any image and then outputs this point at the end. And with this, I'm able to take sort of a random, completely random tile sampled um, you know, over, over my uh, domain where I'm studying in the Atlantic. And actually the network is able to cluster these into, um, into cloud structures that are similar. And then now I have a way basically of of finding out what kind of cloud patterns form. And I can study things like their relative properties and look at how they separate in there and, and look at the um, sort of morphological properties of, of the say fractal dimension and organizational index. So that's, um, that's basically what my, my science is doing. And now I'm, I'm, I'm using this um, for the sort of the whole domain. I'm scanning, scanning you know, feeding in tiles going across the whole domain and looking at what kind of uh, cloud patterns the neural network can feed out here. Um, yeah, so, and then the final step here is to try and understand what causes these different patterns to form. And so here I'm, I'm pulling out data from uh, error five that I then reprojected onto the, the grid that I'm using for the training for the neural network. And I can then look at, say, how does the moisture profile and temperature profile differ in different regions? Um, so this is, this is, for example, this is where, where I've used, been using Jasmine quite a lot. So I would just thought I'd end on, I was trying to think of like particular workflows that are common for me that why I use Jasmine. So I think one thing that's, uh, well, these, these three here that are, that are very common is looking at, uh, looking at new data sets that are on CEDA and, and just trying to like read them in with Python and see how much there is, right? Like, that exercise on CEDA itself can be maybe quite challenging, but if you've got access to the data, then it's actually very easy and can be really, really, uh, really quite fun as well. There's an enormous amount of data on there that's really incredible. The other thing is, is sharing data with collaborators. And finally, because uh, there's, there's access to CEDA, it's, it's also an, um, a way to actually take data and transform it and actually try it out in a machine learning model. So I, I just wanted to give a few specific examples here. So for the Eureka campaign, we had this uh, twin otter aircraft flying, um, like I said, in, in Barbados, and we were flying into clouds and measuring microphysical properties of the clouds and the low cloud. And this is a collaboration with, with people at Manchester and at the Met Office and also at the University of Warsaw. So we needed somewhere to share these observations with each other. And what was nice there is just being able to, you know, create a group workspace that that I, you know, we could give people controls uh, access to, and they can just go in themselves and download the files they need. The other thing that was really great is the ability to actually make a folder in the group waste workspace public. Um, I I use this to basically make once we have data sets that we're happy to share, to to put them into this um, this folder so that. You know the the rest of the Eureka project, which is which is larger than just the UK component, they could then go in and then you know directly download the NetCDF files from there. And this has been incredibly useful to have this sort of way of giving access to part of of what we what we uh, have in the workspace. And finally, in in Paracon, which has been going on for quite a few years now, it's a huge project trying to basically come up with a new convection parameterization for the Met Office Unified Model. We've done a whole suite of these archetypes for nations where we're basically studying cloud formations in large edge simulations. And there, there we're using the group workspaces a lot as well to share these, um, these data sets with each other. 
Um, and the other example I, I mentioned previously is, is this idea of, of basically using um, Jasmine, the Jasmine notebook service as a way to have a look at data that's on CEDAR and, and you know, um, prepare it either for analysis or just even deciding if you want to do a project or not. So I had this idea of um, and this project is sort of starting up now and doing now casting um, of, of rainfall using the eukaryota network and also erifying the analysis. And so I needed both of those data sets. And because um, the, so many things are available from the CEDA archive directly um, locally mounted, I could just go onto the Jasmine notebook page and within half an hour, I could, I made a few plots and I could see what data was available and, you know, how much work would it be to reproject. And then I, I you know, took a bit longer and I could actually create those data sets as I needed them, um, <clears throat> you know, renormalize them, make, make them ready for doing some machine learning. And then finally, um, I could actually try out the, the training of my neural network on the, on the Lotus cluster on the digital. GPUs that are available there, and so having this this whole uh, infrastructure, you know, I don't don't need to download any files. I don't actually have to read the documentation. Personally, I find it much easier to just go ahead and try and code something and try and read the files, and just try it out. This has saved me an awful lot of time, and actually also made it much easier to take these projects that are just a, a quick idea, you know, you get, and then try them out. So. Um, yeah, so that's basically, and this this is a bit of summary of the science at the end. But I thought that I guess the most interesting thing are these these two examples. So that's that's all I got. So if you uh, have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. And the, the actual uh, machine learning technique is published in this paper. So thank you.